Hey guys, Dr. Jamie. I don't know if you guys know this, but almost 75% of Americans are dehydrated. You all know I'm a huge fan of electrolyte supplementation and most Americans are drinking less than 44 ounces of water per day. Well, one thing that might be able to help you get rehydrated and drink more water is by the use of electrolytes. And I wanna introduce you to the Vitamin IQ New Electrolyte Mix. This is the crucial aspect of your wellness. It is intelligent hydration. Not only does it have three times the electrolytes of any sports drink, but it also has a cellular energy blend of D-ribose, taurine, creatine, and NAD precursors. It comes in a delicious orange flavor that my kids love. So if you're looking for a new electrolyte supplement, go check out Vitamin IQ on Amazon or vitaminiq.com. To the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It's so great to have you here today. I have an incredible guest that I want to introduce you all to. Dr. Michael Twyman is a board certified cardiologist who focuses on the prevention and early detection of heart disease. Dr. Twyman completed his cardiovascular training at St. Louis University after he completed a four-year active duty tour as an internist at Naval Hospital Beaufort. He has been in private practice since 2012. Heart attack prevention is his passion, and he utilizes the best conventional medicine, integrative and functional medicine, quantum medicine, and biohacking to get to the root cause of patients' cardiovascular issues. Dr. Twyman, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So you're not just a regular cardiologist. Let's just start off there. <laughs> sure. So tell me, um, tell me what is wrong with traditional cardiology and why they're not having a conversation about prevention and preventing. You would, it would seem that that's their goal to prevent heart attacks, but I, I want to hear your insight on this. Well, I mean, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with conventional cardiology, but their focus is taking care of the acute emergencies, you know, the people rupturing plaques in the middle of the night, the patients with atrial fibrillation, heart failure. So that's what we were trained to do. You know, cardiovascular fellowships, three years long, and the majority of it is spent in the ICU, the cath lab, doing procedures and taking care of very sick individuals. So there wasn't a big focus on prevention at that stage. Um, I just had to get curious and say like, well, we keep fixing all these people in the cath lab, but we keep seeing the same ones back and forth, you know, every six to 12 months. Maybe there's a different way to look at this problem because, you know, everybody ends up on blood pressure medicines and statins and that didn't quote fix the problem. So, you know, you get curious, you go looking. So found the world of functional medicine, started educating myself, going to conferences, and then just said, oh, there's a whole different way to type of look at cardiovascular health. And it's really how healthy are the arteries? How healthy is the endothelium? That's really what my focus is these days. Yeah, I was just about to ask if there, what was the impetus of, of kind of shifting your cardiology practice? Was there like a particular patient or was, what was kind of like the aha moment for you? There wasn't really like one patient I could point to, but yeah, my third year of training, yeah, I was leaning towards potentially becoming an interventional cardiologist. You know, I remained an invasive cardiologist for many years doing angiograms and, you know, multiple procedures, but yeah, to do an extra year or two to do interventional, I was like, I think I'm ready to go out and just start taking care of patients, you know, no more training, I'm done. Um, but I really got interested in the advanced lipid profiles, you know, lipoprotein A, LDL particle, ABOB. I've been looking at those numbers since 2012. Um, and I thought like, well, maybe I can always just kind of, you know, do this on the side while I'm still rounding in the hospital, doing the procedures. And then eventually it just became more and more of my practice where I just got you know, more patients interested in the prevention side of things. I said, well, it's probably time to step away from the cath lab and just really focus on this side of the medicine then. Amazing. So I uh, did a fellowship in integrative medicine. So I complete and utterly respect people that have a little bit different approach, little out of the box thinking. But something that always comes up is that traditional doctors feel like integrative medicine, functional medicine is like all woo. <laughs> One of my family members in particular, I know you've taken care of, um, you know, was told by their traditional cardiologist, hey, listen, they're just going to spend a bunch of money and it's not going to change the outcomes. What are your thoughts about that? 
I think it's mostly just a lack of education of our peers. I mean, you spend so much time and effort learning all these skills and you want to implement them. And then it's the, you know, the idea that this other way that you can look at things is going against everything you've ever thought. And you have to unlearn so much of what you were trained 10 years to go do. And most people just don't want to basically unlearn that. I mean, you were trained to use these skills, you want to use them. Um, so I think it's the the curious ones that, you know, or at least the ones that say like, well, that's interesting. If it works, great. But it's the ones that really get really angry about it without really diving deep into the research. There's yeah. obviously tons and tons of research at looking at different integrative approaches to, to treating these things. And, you know, at least in the cardiovascular world, it's so lipid focused. And, you know, if it was all about lipids, we would have fixed this problem by now. You know, I think the root cause in my mind, it's all about endothelial dysfunction and especially glycocalyx destruction. So if you really look at that as the root cause of cardiovascular disease, well, maybe you wouldn't be having so many events. Yeah. Yeah. I just think it's really the um, complete and, you know, utter lack of open mindedness of, of having actual conversations. I mean, we can all have professional conversations. Let's be real. There's so much we don't know. And I mean, the human body is amazing, right? Like what we know now and what we didn't know 30 years ago is, is it's different. And I think it's hard when you go through your training and you, you know this, and then you get out into practice and you, uh, it's hard to say like, maybe what I was taught isn't the whole story, right? Or you don't stay up to date on things. It's just, but I think out of the box thinkers, let's be real. They are the game changers when it comes to, you know, innovation and in medicine. And, and, uh, I, I couldn't appreciate more of what you do, Dr. Twyman for your patients. So let's talk about how we assess our risk. Uh, you said you, like, you became a fan of this advanced lipid panel. Can you tell people who are listening right now, they're thinking, gosh, I want to know what my risk is. What are the, what are the basic steps for somebody to start thinking about? Sure. The first thing is that it's way more than just having an EKG and a traditional lipid panel and saying you're low risk or having a quote normal stress test. You know, by the time you're having symptoms, which is most likely the reason you're seeing a cardiologist in the first place, you know, you're having chest pain with exertion, you're short of breath or you have exercise intolerance or palpitations. You know, that's the reason that I like, maybe there's something I should go get checked out. So you're probably sometimes really late to the game. Um, so I obviously want to grab people way before they start having the symptoms and atherosclerosis always starts with endothelial dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction can start in your teenage years, your early twenties. So you have 10, 20 years to intervene before they're going to show up with their first plaque rupture or fail the first stress test. So I'm always looking at an artery health approach versus just a biochemical approach. Yes, of course I do you know, multiple blood tests to say, okay, what's currently floating around in your blood but I want to know what is the actual health of the arteries. And there's non-invasive tests that can look at that as well. Tell us what uh, the endothelium is for somebody that's listening. It's like, he says endothelial dysfunction. I have no idea what he's talking about. Is that, is that part of the cardiovascular system? Correct. So it's actually one of your largest organs. The one that most people probably don't know they even have. Uh, the endothelium is the inner lining of your blood vessels. So amazingly, you have up to 60,000 miles of blood vessels, enough blood vessels to wrap around the earth twice. But inside the blood vessels, there's a lining called the endothelium. It's one cell thick. If you're able to strip out all your endothelium, it would actually be about the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's a very, wow. very large organ. And it's kind of like the air traffic controller. It determines what floats in the lumen where the blood is and what has access to the actual artery wall. So certain things are supposed to be able to pass through it, but not everything. And the major issue is when the ApoB containing particles, you now there's no such thing as good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, but the ApoB particles are the ones that cause plaque. If they get retained in the artery wall, then the plaque cascade starts kicking off. Yeah. Okay. So talk to us about um, this advanced lipid panel. What does the advanced lipid panel contain that that is more than a standard lipid panel? Because I think most people listening have just had a standard lipid panel done by their primary care. For sure. And then the standard lipid panel is not worthless, but it's not very good at predicting risk. So in a standard panel, all you're going to get is your total cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol, and your triglycerides. So the way I would look at it is I would look at first, is your total cholesterol greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter? Is your LDL cholesterol greater than 190 milligrams per deciliter? If it is, then it's possible that you have familial hyperlipidemia or FH for short. FH is genetically inherited and it's the 
reason why you have high cholesterol. It's usually an issue with APOB proteins or your LDL receptors, which we can talk about. But that's the only way I look at the traditional fats. Like if it's really high, maybe there's a genetic reason for it. But you also see this in people who go on keto diets or you know have certain other genetic issues where they have quote normal cholesterol panels, they change up their diet and the numbers go through the roof. These are the quote lean mass hyper responders, which is somewhat of a misnomer. But the traditional panel doesn't really predict risk very well because Cholesterol is a critical molecule. Without it, you're not alive. You, know, you use your cholesterol to make your sex hormones, your vitamin D, your bile acids to digest fats, your cell membranes. But cholesterol is a fat. And much like oil and vinegar, it's not going to float in your liquid blood. So how the traditional cholesterol panel is measured is they take your blood, they spin it down in a centrifuge, they break all the lipoproteins, and the passengers inside those kind of cargo ships fall out. And they just measure, well, how many cholesterol molecules are in your entire bloodstream at any one time. Well, what's actually more important is well, how many lipoproteins are actually carrying that cholesterol around your bloodstream at any one time. So I always use the analogy of a tennis ball in my office. You know, your liver is making these tennis balls. Those are the lipoprotein, the lipid protein carriers. Inside the lipid protein carrier goes the cholesterol, the triglycerides, the fat soluble vitamins, phospholipids, all these building blocks for the cells and the liver pumps them out and ships them through the blood vessels. Now they're supposed to be delivered to your muscles or your other organs that need supplies. But if the arteries have endothelial dysfunction and basically low nitric oxide is present, then these lipoproteins are more likely to stick to your artery wall like Velcro, and then that can kick off this inflammatory cascade that leads to plaque in your arteries. So if you look at the number of particles instead of just the cholesterol, we have a better idea of what the risk is. So the number would be your LDL particle number or your apolipoprotein B, which for the most part is pretty equivalent to your LDL particle number in most people. What, um, so I have my, I have my recent labs pulled up. We'll just pick on me for a minute. Okay. So I get this advanced lipid panel back and total cholesterol is, uh, 184. So that seems fine. Um, my triglycerides are 58 HDL is 72 and LDL is 114. So I'm a person that eats a ketogenic diet. And my LDL really doesn't at some points, actually, it's been as low as like 95, like less than hundred on a ketogenic diet. So if somebody, cause I think everybody gets scared about this LDL number, but tell people what can the triglycerides and HDL on just a basic panel tell you about your risk? Sure. And I said that in the standard panels, like I first look at the total and the LDL cholesterol. That's just kind of the quick check. Does that person have FH or not? Familial hyperlipidemia. Okay. But the second thing I would look at is I will look at the uh, HDL cholesterol triglyceride ratio. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you know, it should be that you should have no more than twice as many triglycerides as you do HDL cholesterol. So, you know, if you're triglycerides are 100, your HDL ideally should be 50 or greater, so that that number would be two or less. It's a rough check on, is that person likely insulin sensitive or not? If you have yeah. excessively high triglycerides, it's more likely that person may be insulin resistant. But too many people in the kind of the keto communities and the carnivore communities, you know, hang their hat on that. Like I have a low triglyceride HDL ratio and I'm not insulin resistant. So these high lipoproteins really don't matter. And that's not so much true. Yeah. Okay. So then on the advanced lipid panel, you said something about LDLP, LDL particles. What number are we looking for here? Depends on the labs. And this is where it's always kind of uh, the nuance is that, you know, what is normal is a bunch of sick people getting labs and they say, this is the reference range, but what is um, optimal generally is probably going to be less than a thousand particles um, on most lab panels. Okay. Awesome. Mine's less than a thousand. Okay. And then the other things you mentioned, APOA and APOB, what are those? Sure. So first focus on the APOB side of the equation. So apolipoprotein B is a protein. Now on the tennis ball analogy, the lipoprotein is the tennis ball. On the outside of the tennis ball is the white stripe. That white stripe is essentially ApoB. That white stripe keeps the tennis ball in a sphere, so it's structural. But ApoB is also a ligand, meaning it's basically a key. So when that tennis ball full of cholesterol is floating through your blood, it's going to bind to different receptors. And then those you know, muscle cells, they're going to pull in that lipoprotein and download what they need. So ApoB is on the outside of all the LDL particles, the VLDL particles, the ILDL particles, 
And then up to 20% of the population will have something called lipoprotein little a or LP little a. It's those individuals mm -hmm. that tend to have a discordant number where they'll have, you know, very high ApoB and maybe their LDL particle count might be low. Well, where's the ApoB coming from? It's from the LP little a. Okay. So if there's one thing, when you say, when we're saying, what is this patient's risk? If you can only pick like one or two things off this advanced lipid panel, what would you pick? If it's the advanced panel, I would look at the ApoB first. And then if they had been checked for LPLA, that'd be second. Now, you know, if you have just an LDL particle number, that's correlated, you know, generally 90% of the time if people don't have LPLA. So if that's all the numbers that you got, that's good enough for most cases. Um, but and a lot of people want to get in the weeds on the sizes of the particles and you know, what about the HDL sizes? That's so much secondary to after what is ApoB doing to your arteries. You had asked earlier about like, what is ApoA? Well, ApoA is the protein on the outside of the HDL particles. And there may be up to like five of these ApoAs on the outside of HDLs. Um, so it's not as um, helpful at predicting risk at looking just at your ApoA. So there's no such thing as good cholesterol. There's no such thing as bad cholesterol, but all things mm -hmm. being considered, you'd rather have lower ApoB and higher ApoA. Okay. Okay. So let's move on beyond the lipid panel. How, what are other ways that we can assess risk in these patients? So I usually kind of lump it into three buckets. One of them is going to be the lipoproteins. And then the other buckets are going to be inflammation, oxidative stress. And then the other bucket is nitric oxide. So the inflammatory cascade and the oxidative stress cascade. So are your arteries on fire? Are your arteries smoking? So the classic lab, most even general cardiologists will check now is the high sensitivity CRP, HSCRP. Ideally, this number should be less than one. You know, this is a protein made in your liver. It's kind of an average of what's going on with your immune system. So it's not very specific and it's not necessarily bad if it's up one time. It's a problem if it's chronically elevated. Mm -hmm. If your number's over 10, you probably recently had an infection or surgery or, you know, something autoimmune is happening in you. You got to go dig into like, why is this CRP so high? But there are some markers that are more specific to blood vessels, such as LPPLA2, which is known as the plaque test, PLAC. If that enzyme is elevated, it tends to mean that there's plaque in your arteries that's highly inflamed and potentially more likely to rupture. There's myeloperoxidase or MPO. MPO is another marker. Are the arteries on fire essentially? But if you have high myeloperoxidase, it's a surrogate for how well the HDL is actually functioning. And that's a much more important nuanced idea is, you know, what is the HDL actually doing in the body? Because just having high HDL cholesterol is not necessarily a guarantee that your arteries are healthy. If you have high myeloproxidase, the myeloproxidase keeps damaging the HDL and you have to keep making more HDLs to replace the damaged one. So, you know, if you have low LPPLA2, low myeloproxidase, you less likely have fire in the arteries. And then there's markers of oxidative stress. You can check oxidized LDL, oxidized phospholipid on ApoB. So are you rusting or oxidizing your cholesterol particles? That's bad. Those are the things that tend to get stuck in the artery walls and kick off more plaque cascades. And then there's a urine test called F2 isoprostane, and then they divide it by your urine creatinine. And that's the sort of like the lifestyle test. So when people say that they're you know, eating clean, exercising, well, this number should be generally very low. If it's not low, well, then their body's essentially rusting from the inside out. They have very high oxidative stress, and then that tends to kick off more inflammation. So those are the kind of main inflammatory oxidative stress markers I usually check at baseline in most people. And that's why I tell people, is like, if you have healthy nitric oxide and no significant inflammation, well, then the lipoproteins are much less likely to be sticking to your artery walls and kicking off this plaque formation. But we talked earlier about the endothelium. Yeah, you know, the endothelium, that inner lining of your arteries, one of the major things that it does is release nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a very short-lived gas. And that gas is produced right on the lining of the arteries. And when the gas diffuses off the arteries, it causes the muscle under the artery wall to relax. And when the artery relaxes, the flow improves. So that keeps blood pressure normalized. So your blood pressure should ideally be less than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. But nitric oxide also acts sort of like Teflon or non-stick surface. When you have high levels, then the lipoproteins, the white blood cells, the platelets, they were repelled from sticking to the artery walls. They just kind of slide on through. So the first sign that there's a problem is you start having lower nitric oxide levels, 
then things start sticking to the arteries. And you can test nitric oxide with salivary nitric oxide strips. There's different non-invasive tests that look at the arterial elasticity. There's something called the pulse wave velocity. There's a couple of devices that measure that. We have a device in our office called the endopath that measures by percentage how much the arteries dilate with a vessel stressor. And then blood work, you can look at asymmetric dimethylarginine, symmetric dimethylarginine, ADMA, SDMA is what they stand for. When those numbers are high, they tend to lower nitric oxide. High homocysteine is also associated with low nitric oxide, as is high uric acid. If you have high uric acid, mm -hmm. it damages the glycohelix, lowers nitric oxide. And you know, uric acid is now becoming a more known kind of biomarker for people who are, you know, having issues with, you know, their high consumption of fructose, alcohol, you know, if they can't break that stuff down effectively, they'll have high uric acid levels. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so these labs, should people check these on an annual basis? What are your thoughts about assessing risk? Because we're really trying to find, right, a problem before it becomes a real problem. Sure. And I think it's one of those cases where it's like, you know, when do you start screening? You know, ideally, some of these things you would do like age 18. You know, do you have LPLA? Mm. Do you have some of the genetic markers? If you do, then you probably need to be assessed yearly. But, you know, that's in a perfect world. Ideally, I'm happy if I can get people in their 40s. 45 to start this process. I was about to say, my yeah. soon to be 40 year old husband um, <laughs> yeah. does yeah. not it's go like, to the doctor regularly. Most guys never go to the doctor unless there's a problem. And that's, you know, my job to educate people was like, my goal is do these tests, make sure there's not a problem, and then go up on your way. And I literally just saw two gentlemen in their mid 40s who were surprised to have high calcium scores tests. One of them ended up with a stent, one didn't once had a stroke and like they would have not seen conventional cardiology for many years. Now we're doing the right. deep dive with them to figure out why did you guys develop this at such an early age? So, you know, it's never too early to start getting screened for some of these things, but back to your thing about like how often it should be, you know, at baseline. And then if there's no high risk findings, probably yearly, but if there's a high risk finding, then you implement some lifestyle intervention or some nutraceutical intervention or some pharmacological intervention. And then, 90 to 180 days later, you would recheck and see where things were at. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the coronary artery calcium. I, as a gynecologist, um, somehow see a lot of ketogenic patients in my office with mm -hmm. abnormal lipid panels. And I'm not a cardiologist, but in patients that have this isolated LDL um, or maybe a higher ApoB, I'm sending them to get coronary artery calcium scans. Um, so tell people what role do these play in assessing our risk? So the CT coronary calcium scan is the equivalent, in my mind, like a mammogram. It's a screening preventative test, trying to find things at the earliest stages when it's more easily intervenable on. So calcium is supposed to be in your bones and teeth. Calcium in the walls of the artery is indicative that you basically had some break-ins to the artery wall with some of these ApoB containing particles. They've kicked off this inflammatory cascade and you're basically building up abscesses or these little pimples in the artery wall. The body will try to take care of that by scarring it down, and eventually the process will calcify. So the calcium is the stabilizing factor. So the calcium is not necessarily the problem. It's the other plaque that comes with it, the soft plaque. So ideally, on a calcium score test, your score will be zero your entire life. The younger you are, your score really should be zero. You know, the, the gentleman I just saw, yeah, with scores that were, you know, one was over 300, one was over 500, they were in the 99th percentile for age, meaning only 1% of the people of their age had scores higher than them. So generally, when people are in the 40s and 50s, their score is zero. So that's not really that useful of a risk metric because that's what you expect. It's the weird cases when you find scores greater than zero, they're like, oh, we really got to find the genetic reason or what's going on with this person. Often, again, it's LPLA, which up to 20% of the population has. The caveat too is that like there's 80 year olds I take care of and they still have calcium scores of zero. Well, whatever they've been doing is working for them. So you treat them a little bit more gingerly. So it's a great starting point to predict risk in all comers, but there's other things that you have to do because it's only looking for the hard plaque. You haven't yet discovered, you know, does that person have soft plaque or do they have endothelial dysfunction? The kind of the early warning signs that something's going on with their arteries. But it's a great starting point, and it's something that primary care doctors, OBGYNs, you know, they should have access to being able to order these type of tests just to kind of lump their patients into your low risk, keep doing what you're doing, or hey, this mm -hmm. is abnormal. I know you're not symptomatic right now, but I'd recommend you go get some further lab work to figure out what's driving this plaque in your arteries. 
Yeah. I feel like maybe just behind the cardiologist, I probably order the most CAC scans in my, in my community. So it's yeah. a cheap test. I mean, in my, in my town, it's like hundred, 125 bucks, you know, just yep. to pay cash for it. So can you reverse coronary calcium? It's a nuanced question. So I get that often. The answer is yes. I have seen patients who have CT coronary calcium scores less than 100 go all the way back down to zero, but that's not necessarily the goal. You know, the first goal is don't have an event. Don't have one of these plaques rupture and the blood clot, and then you have a heart attack or you have a stroke if it happens in your carotid artery. So that's always the first goal. And that's why I tell patients is first discover that you have plaque and then come upon a regimen to help stabilize that plaque so it doesn't get any worse. So that's the first win. But at times the plaques can delipidate or shrink. That's one of the benefits of HDL is that it can get into these plaques, basically suck out the cholesterol and then pull it out of the artery wall. And then that pimple will shrink down. But often the calcium does not go with it. Now there are certain treatments such as statin therapies, which are utilizing people who are at higher risk. One of the ways that tends to happen is that it will generally probably take that softer plaque, the plaque that's more likely to rupture and cause a heart attack, and it will calcify it. So if somebody has a calcium score test, that's whatever score, they get initiated on the statin and you repeat the calcium score, their calcium score test is going to go up. That does mm. not necessarily mean that they're higher risk. You took the soft plaque that you can't see on a calcium score test and you calcified it and stabilized it. So now there are different things like vitamin K2 that you know can help stabilize plaques and sometimes will you know, basically try to keep the calcium from building further up in the artery wall. Sometimes yeah. they may get the plaques to shrink down and maybe the calcium score test goes down a little bit, but that's not really the, the goal of treatment. Yeah. So my own husband, uh, age 34, 35 at the time, this was over five years ago, got, we got baseline coronary calciums, walked in there, thought for sure we're both going to be a zero. Uh, mine was a zero and his was not, uh, I believe his total score was like 186, which was greater than the 99th percentile. Mm -hmm. So of course on this piece of paper, it says like, go see cardiology. You need to start intensive statin therapy. At the time he was eating a ketogenic diet, which was mostly beef, eggs, butter, everything that mm -hmm. a cardiologist would tell him not to eat. Right. Um, and so we're, we were kind of like at this crux, like, what do we do? Um, he had a grandfather who dropped dead at the age of 52 of a heart attack. Um, and so his mom went and got a test and her CAC was very low. So we only assumed it maybe came from, from that side of the family. Um, nobody did any genetic testing, uh, or anything like that at the time, but we decided to, uh, he was starting to make a lot of new lifestyle changes, starting to work out again. He was a former college athlete. So he stayed on his diet. He did start vitamin K2 and, um, you know, doing a little more relaxation, left a stressful job in the midst of all this. So we just repeated his five-year, uh, CAC update and his score was zero like zero, like not decreased. It was zero. And I was like, yeah. about fell off my chair. Um, so then of course I requested the images because I thought, well, maybe somebody <laughs> didn't read this right. And I got the images and it's, it's, it appears legitimate. So now I'm uh, a gynecologist trying to collect all this data to see if we can, you know, somehow come up with a case series or something like that, that to kind of look at what are these things that, you know, uh, change people's risk. But because, you know, from my standpoint, your blood vessels go everywhere, right? So if you have if you have cardiovascular disease, you, you know, it affects the brain, it affects the kidneys, it affects the ovaries, it affects the uterus, like it, it affects everything, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. it's 60,000 miles of vessels and the majority of your blood vessels are microvasculatures. So the, or micro vessels, I should say. So, you know, there's estimated like up to a hundred of these micro vessels would fit in the diameter of one human hair. So they're extremely, extremely small and they're bringing the lion's share of the oxygen nutrients to your tissues. And life is about getting oxygen nutrients into tissues so that you can make energy in those tissues. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about statins, but I know there's somebody listening that's like, ask them a question about statins. So um, who benefits from, I mean, it seems like they're very widely prescribed. Um, who benefits from statins? Who doesn't? And it's a great question. And this is somewhere where, you know, when you kind of trip the wire and you're going to see a conventional cardiologist, usually have a big enough problem that like all their patients are going to be on statins. But when you're out into the general world, well, then you got to be a little bit more nuanced. So the main people that benefit are people for secondary prevention. This is when they've already had an event. They've already had a heart attack, a stroke. They already have stents. They've already had bypass surgery. Okay. They get a statin put on board to try to reduce the second time of having that. 
very clear data that significantly reduces that risk. Where it's so a little you've more had an event, than, you've uh, had an event. Re- there is a benefit, right? There's a definite clear benefit. There's like no, even in the functional integrated world, like there's not a really argument that those people shouldn't be at least tried on sense if it's you know proven that they can tolerate them and not everybody tolerates them. We can get into that part, but the nuance part is like primary prevention, especially younger people, especially women, you know, especially women of childbearing age. I see a lot of people. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, like it stands the right choice for those individuals. And most likely the case is probably not, you know, if you do not have significant plaque in your arteries, you know, unless you have familial hyperlipidemia and, you know, have total cholesterols in the four or 500 range, you know, maybe you have some other options first. So, you know, have you cleaned up their nutrition so that they're not insulin resistant anymore? You know, are they doing appropriate resistance training and cardiorespiratory fitness? Like, you know, have you fixed all the low hanging fruit first? And then with some of these advanced testing that you can do, you can see, is it more an issue with the liver hyper producing sterols? Okay, well then that's where stands tend to work best for these people. But if they can't tolerate stands, then pembidoic acid, which is nexatol, you know, or fibrates or omega threes. That's the process where it works in the liver. Is it an issue with their gut hyperabsorbing these sterols, which you can test on the uh, lab called the cholesterol balance test? If that lights up red, well, that's where azetamide or zetia would work better for that individual, block the sterols from being reabsorbed into the portal circulation. So it is always nuanced. I tell people stands are tools. I still use them, but they're not supposed to be in the drinking water for everybody. You know, there's just some people that are just not going to tolerate them. And then there's definitely, you know, the people who have religious objections to like, I'm not taking anything pharmacological. Okay, well, I'm mostly cared about what is your APOB, what's your inflammatory load, what's your endothelial function. If those are all normal and, you know, by classic guidelines that recommend SAN, well, you don't have any endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, your APOB is 45. Well, why would you start SAN in that person? So it is very nuanced. Yeah. So I went to low carb Denver this year and, um, there was two cardiologists that presented and both gave incredible uh, lectures, but they disagreed on one point and that was on statins. So we had one doctor, uh, you know, that kind of said CAC, uh, if the CAC is zero, that is very reassuring. Not a lot of, you know, a use for statins in CACs that are higher, you know, he kind of gave a little bit more, uh, support for, for the use of statins. And then this next cardiologist comes up and of course this is all like very, you know, professional friendly discussion. Um, but he thinks that for the vast majority of patients, uh, who haven't had an event, they really shouldn't be using statins. And a lot of it, uh, he was showing literature and data on toxicity of the mitochondria. And I see there's mitochondria for people on YouTube right behind Dr. Twyman's head. That's a mitochondria back there. So, um, just kind of weigh in with your opinion, I guess, on for primary prevention, is a CAC of zero reassuring and statins roll with the mitochondria? Correct. And that's, that is kind of the, the interesting kind of use case of the calcium score test is sometimes the tiebreaker for the people who say like, do I really want to go on a lifelong therapy? Well, if your calcium score is over 400, the benefit is likely greater than the risk at that stage. But if your calcium score is zero, then yes, you have a, you know, uh, conversation with whoever's treating you and say like, these are my hopes and goals and dreams and you know, what I'm willing to do and not do. And the person sitting across from you should hopefully respect that. You know, but I think that sometimes it's really challenging to say what is true primary prevention? Because while the calcium score test is a great test, you know, it still misses 10, 15% of people who have soft plaque in their arteries. So if you do a CT coronary angiogram, well, more radiation, more cost, more risk. You won't miss those patients that have soft plaque that is already building up and hasn't calcified yet. So if you do that test, which there's a uh, AI kind of overlay software uh, program called Clearly, which will analyze the plaque characteristics and will tell you how much hard plaque versus soft plaque versus low density plaque, that really is kind of, in my mind, going to be the future gold standard say like, oh, these are the people that are going to benefit most from statin therapy. I've been doing this clearly test for almost two years. I've only seen two individuals with perfect scores of zero. And they're always, Mm. you know, younger women. And it's, you know, they were done because they had strong family histories. Everybody else, people who have calcium scores of zero, normal carotid and intermedial thickness, quote, normal lipid panels, they all have soft plaque. 
it's just that sense of attachment. If you go looking for it, you will find it. And then that's where you kind of get stuck. Like, what do we do with those individuals? But back to your original point, if your calcium score is zero and you're just like, I really don't want to be on stand, well, what is your APOB and what are you willing to do to lower it if you're willing to lower it? I think I'm going to come down to St. Louis and let you put me through the ringer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have clear, <laughs> we don't have clearly, uh, clearly skins in Omaha yet. So we're, uh, we're waiting. We don't drive covered wagons though, people. I yeah. promise we have cars and things <laughs> like that. Um, okay. So I've heard you talk on social media about kind of your four pillars of heart health. So I want to dive into these for people on YouTube. They can probably see you're wearing some glasses that don't look like they yeah. have clear lenses, kind of have these orange glasses on. Yeah. So talk to me about sleep and recovery and light, because I know this is a, a, a passion of yours. Tell me what role that plays in heart health. Yes. And it's, it's one of those interesting things because, you know, everybody wants to kind of fight on the exercise and nutrition and, you know, there, there's, you know, lots of ways to skin a cat for those. And, you know, they are important. And I tell people they are important. We're going to get to those. But if you don't get your circadian rhythms right and you don't get your recovery and your sleep right, it almost doesn't matter how you eat or how you exercise because your body's not going to recover. And yes, for those watching on the video, this is a giant mitochondria behind me because I'm all about optimizing the energy in the mitochondria. Your mitochondria, you know, require optimal sleep to be able to repair themselves. Think of them as your engines. You know, you need a finely tuned engine to go 200 miles an hour the next day. If you put in premium gas into an engine, you never tune up, you don't go real fast. So just eating a clean ketogenic diet but not focusing on recovery and sleep is going to be counterproductive. You're not going to get the energy out that you want. So the kind of the funny looking glasses, I've been doing this since at least 2017 when I realized the benefit of these that helping me not basically die from jet lag flying over to Asia. And I was like, Oh, there's something to this thing where you like block a lot of artificial light, you sleep better. So then I, you know, start reading books like, you know, the circadian code by Dr. Panda and following mm -hmm. the circadian biology uh, experts and being like, Oh, if you do this, your sleep quality improves and there's multiple different sleep trackers I've tried in the past. And yes, it always is confirmed that I have better recovery scores, better deep sleep when I wear the glasses in the evening time. I wear them pretty much all the time from technology during the day, just because I always want to know what time it is outside by the light that hits my eyes. I don't want the computer screens to tell my brain it's the wrong time of day. The screens that we're looking at right now, they're set at 5,500 Kelvin, which is the exact same color temperature is solar noon. So whenever you look at your computer or your mm. devices at night, your brain keeps getting a hit that it's noon time. And that time of day, you're supposed to be pumping out cortisol to stay alert. Well, cortisol is a great hormone at the right time of day. But if you have high cortisol when you're trying to sleep, you're not going to sleep well. And high cortisol also tends to make you hold on to fat. You know, it raises blood sugar. So you, you, know, you want to have cortisol be up at the right time and low when it's dark. And yeah. promoting darkness through your eye helps that cortisol drop appropriately. Yeah, I was just about to ask, is there a disadvantage of wearing them all the time? I mean, I, I know I've seen Dave Asprey do it and a few other people do it. Or, I mean, can you overwear them like early in the day? No, not necessarily. I mean, it's more about the key time to wear them is anytime you're in front of technology. So, you know, in an optimal day, you would never spend any minute of it inside except when you're sleeping. But that's not reality these days. So in an optimal day, the first bright light that I see is sunlight. I want, you know, full spectrum light to hit the back of my eyes and tell my brain what time of day it is. But then when I come inside, you know, my office is very circadian friendly. I don't have a bunch of, you know, junk light on in here, but when I'm in front of screens, I put on the glasses and the glasses are going to block up to about 450 nanometers of light. So some of the blue light is still going to get through. So your brain still can make some cortisol and still stay alert. But once the sun sets, well, before they invented the light bulb, that was it. You know, you had fire, and but you generally went to bed three to four hours after the sun set. Now with these bright lit devices, your brain gets the signal, well, it's still daytime, and then people start falling asleep at 10, 30, 11, midnight, one o'clock, and think that's normal. But that's evolutionary, never what you would have done. You know, there's a few percentage of people, and I always get pushback like, oh, well, I'm a night owl. Like, most people truly aren't a night owl if they actually would do a lot of the circadian rhythm kind of optimization. But if you block the artificial light at night, you know, especially that hour before you go to bed, your sleep quality tends to improve. And so I have some of the darker lenses. You've probably seen the, like the red Terminator ones before. Yeah, Those ones just knock me unconscious. I can only wear them for about a half hour. So I Same. rarely need them. I don't rarely yeah. need them anymore. But if I'm traveling, I'll throw them in my bag just to make sure I can go to sleep on the plane when I need to. Yep. That's when I wore, I had a flight to Santiago, Chile this last year. That's the last time I've worn them because yeah, yeah. if I'm in my house, I throw those on and I'm like, like I better yeah. find my bed really quickly. 
Um, okay. Another thing I see you use is red light and my followers know I'm a huge fan of red light for a variety of reasons, but what role does that play in heart health? It's a great question. So photobiomodulation is something that, uh, I've been diving deep into the past couple of years. Um, it's you know, how do you use light therapy to change your biology? That's basically what photobiomodulation means. Um, and there's many use cases, but if you want to break it down, it's really all about mitochondrial health. So again, life's about energy. So photobiomodulation, especially the red spectrum of light and infrared, they penetrate into that mitochondria and three main things happen. So without going too deep into it, you know, your mitochondria will then make more ATP. It will make more energy. It will lower oxidative stress. So you have less inflammation, less rustability from the inside out. And it also will liberate nitric oxide from the mitochondria. The nitric oxide then can be diffused into the arteries and increase blood flow to the territories. So most use cases are musculoskeletal in nature. You know, it was actually discovered in the late 1960s on accident. They were using red ruby, red ruby lasers in uh, rats and cancer research. They're actually trying to see where the lasers cause cancer, but it was actually showing that when they were uh, treating the animals with it, the ones that got treatment with it grew fur back at a much higher rate. So hair growth was the first indication that, yes. hey, there's something going on with this. So, I've been using it for that reason. I, uh, yeah. I got salmonella poisoning last year and got a fever of 105.6 and uh, may have had COVID around that time too. But I have regrowth now that's like three to four inches long, but I've been trying to get that red light right next to my scalp. Right. And that's the, what was happening is that, you know, the, the stem cells that are in those hair follicles, the mitochondria them are absorbing those photons of light and they're producing more energy. And with the energy, then the stem cells can differentiate and kick back up and start growing some hair follicles for you. Amazing. Does it penetrate deep enough to get to the heart? Like, uh, yeah, if you your put question. your chest in front of it? Yes, no. So on average, you know, most uh, devices, you know, the red spectrum of lights only can penetrate about one centimeter and the infrared spectrum is probably four or five centimeters. So can it reach the heart in ways it can, but generally it's more about activating stem cells with the light. So there's a lot of stem cells that live okay. in your tibia and your sternum. So that's probably how it actually would work. There was yeah. a fascinating study done in Israel a couple of years ago where they treated patients who were having ST elevation MIs. So the patients were having the worst kind of heart attack. They show up to the cath lab. They got standard of care. They all got angioplasties. They got stented, but half the group got uh, at that time, they're calling it low-level light therapy or LLT, but same thing. But they got light treatment at the time they were getting the cath. And because they didn't want to interfere with the uh, interventional cardiologist, they weren't anywhere up near the heart. They treated the patient's tibias with a laser. They treated them for with um, it was 810 nanometers of light. Uh, the uh, top of my head, I think the irradiance was somewhere like in the uh, 10 milliwatts per centimeter squared, if I remember that right. But the dose was one joule per centimeter squared. They did that at like the time they came into the cath lab, next day, and three days after the procedure. Now, at nine months, the patients had the exact same outcomes. Their ejection fractions, how well their heart squeezed was the same. But immediately after the procedures, the patients who had gotten light therapy had lower levels of troponin, low levels of creatinine kinase in their blood, indicating they basically had smaller heart attacks. So how does that work? Well, the stem cells and the bone marrow absorbed all that photonic energy provided energy to the stem cells that then migrated to the heart that was ischemic and helped reduce the damage that was going on from the lack of blood flow. So there's mm -hmm. at least a use case where it didn't cause any harm to do it. It was a very small trial. I think there's only like 12 individuals in this trial, but this is the main trial that showed that there's some cardiac benefit without having to directly treat the heart. Interesting. My wheels are like over here turning, yeah. like thinking about preeclampsia. I've got like my patients in the hospital in the red light ward. <laughs> I've, uh, okay. All right. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So let's, uh, oh, let's talk about nutrition. I don't want to spend the whole time talking about nutrition, but, um, it's such a controversial topic, right? People are like, don't eat red meat. Don't eat saturated fat. It clogs your arteries. What is the, what is the optimal diet for reducing risk of heart disease? Is there one? I don't think there's an optimal diet that works for everybody. It's nuanced, obviously. So I always start first off with, do you know your maternal haplotype? That is essentially, you know, something you can obtain on 23andMe. It's essentially, where did your original mitochondria come from? 
So again, your mitochondria, they do many things for you, but they make energy. That's the thing we're going to be talking about right now because they're the engines that are going to break down your food products. So you inherit your mitochondria only from your mom. She gets it from her mom. So for the most part, the healthier your mom is, the healthier your grandma is on that side, that's your starting battery packs in life. Mm, so mitochondria are what you're trying to manage. Your mitochondria do not eat fat, carbs, or protein. They basically break down the food products, the carbs and the fats into electrons and protons. And then those electrons come into the mitochondria. They basically go through these different respiratory proteins, kind of like hopscotch. And then when they get to the end of it, ATP is made. So life is all about this electron flow. And so how do you get electrons into the system? Well, most people it's through nutrition, but other ways you can get electrons into the system is when you're outside and you're earthing and grounding, your bare feet, bare hands on the ground, you're going to absorb electrons into your system that can then funnel through those mitochondria. The other way is when light is hitting your skin, you're going to charge, separate the water in your system into negative and positive charges. So this is one of the reasons when you go to the beach, you probably don't have as big of an appetite because you're basically getting electrons from your environment. You don't have to eat much food to collect those electrons. So that's how I start at first. People are like, it blows their mind in ways where you're like, it really does come down to quantum physics. But then, you know, what do you actually do practically? Well, circadian biology, the best time to eat is generally daylight hours. That is the zeitgeber or time giver to your liver and gut so that your body knows, oh, it's daytime. This person's foraging for food. You know, we need to be alert and go get this stuff. And then, you know, once it's dark, the body needs a signal like, you know, we got to flip over to kind of like repair mode. Like this person's not going to be eating anymore. So I tell patients most of the time you should stop eating three to four hours before you plan to go to bed. You know, the thermogenic effect of food starts going down, your body temperature drops and the drop in your body temperature is one of the biggest signals for your body to initiate sleep and go into deeper sleep. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll notice as if you have a sleep tracking ring, like if you eat, you know, 30 minutes before you go to bed, you know, you'll go to sleep, but you're going to see your temperature higher, your heart rate availability will probably be lower, your resting heart rate will be higher. Now your body's trying to churn through that food you just put in the system. So timing of your meals, it'll probably come out later that that's at least as important, if not more important than what you're actually fueling the body with. So I start with timing the meals first. And then, you know, what is your mitochondria? The other big thing is seasonality. You know, where do you live in the world? You know, if you have four seasons, for the most part, you would probably have four different types of diets because you would have eaten what was naturally growing in your environment at that time. I was just recently in Finland a couple of months ago, and it's completely dark up there for like six weeks in the wintertime. There's nothing <laughs> growing up there at the time. There's reindeer. They eat a lot of reindeer meat, you know? So mm. at that time of year, they're much more catotic. And then in the spring, summer, when things grow, they eat more carbohydrates. So they are just eating with what they had available to them. I just but can you tell me what Rudolph, what does Rudolph taste like? It's actually delicious. It's, it's okay. way more delicious than actually venison. It's not gamey at all. So yeah, so yeah. ranger steaks are delicious. But, okay. uh, you know, but I tell people like keto diets, can they can work for people? But evolutionary, like you would have just kind of cycled through keto because by choice, you wouldn't have done it. But your body should be a flex fuel. You can burn fuel, you can burn, uh, you can burn fat for fuel, you can burn carbs for fuel. But you know, it was based off what your environment was seeking. But back to the quantum standpoint, unless the food was made in a lab, food is tied to photosynthesis. So sunlight grew your plant that you ate, or you're eating the animal that ate the plant. And then it's the job of your mitochondria to break down that food back to sunlight, essentially. You know, those electrons are stored energy and information from the environment. So when you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, the body gets a signal. Oh, it must be summertime because it takes a lot of sunlight to grow this food. When your body's eating fats and there's no carbs coming in, body's like, it must be winter time. So we probably might want to like not lose this fat in the winter time. So, you know, that is kind of what evolution put into you. Like fat is not a dirty word. I mean, you know, without fat, our species would not have survived. It's the modern mm -hmm. environment that kind of breaks these signals that then, you know, makes us hold on to fat in places we don't want it. Like subcutaneous fat may not look pretty, but that was evolutionarily beneficial to allow us to survive. It's a problem when people become severely insulin resistant that they start storing all this fat around their organs. It's the visceral yeah. fat that's really the problem. Yeah. Okay. So d does red meat cause heart disease? Not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's always kind of my caveat. I mean, yeah. Uh, the saturated, saturated fat. fat. Heart disease. Not necessarily. You know, 
there's a nuance here. You had said they are, you're doing a keto type diet and your LDL cholesterol didn't go through the roof. But there are people that do these, and I've seen their other cholesterols go to 300 milligrams per deciliter. And then, then they you know, throw back to like, well, my HDL cholesterol is 70 and my triglycerides are 40. I, I'm fine. Like, well, is your endothelium fine? Is your blood pressure fine? Is your, you know, yeah. you know everything else look good in your arteries? If the answer is yes, then you're one of those people that that's going to work for you. But there are some tests that you can see at times. You know, what is your APOE genotype? That gives you an idea of like how well you're going to do with certain saturated fats. Um, and then there's some other SNPs that can kind of point you in the right direction, but it's a test don't guess type of philosophy. So have a baseline test, make whatever nutrition intervention you want, and then retest and see what happens. But in some people, yes, eating high saturated fat tends to increase the liver production of cholesterol. So then you have to make more of these LDL particles to ferry that cholesterol around the system. But it's also known that the saturated fat will downregulate the LDL receptor on the liver. So the LDL receptor is what's catching all these lipoproteins as they flow through the bloodstream. So if you don't have as many of those, then the LDL particles tend to increase. But you don't know that going into the situation. So some people I've seen, probably as yourself, it has really no effect. They could be high saturated fat and nothing happens. But there's some people that, you know, they go 20, 30% of their calories from saturated fat, all their numbers go haywire. And you just like, you can decide what you want to do. Like, hey, I feel great. Body composition is where I want to be. Well, what are you willing to change? Are you willing to eat more monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated mm -hmm. fat? No. Okay. Are you willing to take azetamide so that you don't absorb as much of this fat from your gut? Yes. Okay. Well then start azetamide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, genetically I am supposed to be an obese diabetic with really bad heart disease. So <laughs> try <laughs> everything to not, uh, to not have that be my story. Okay. So, uh, we talked about seasonal eating, timing of eating, Let's talk about exercise. Is all exercise good? Is there a specific form of exercise, resistance training, interval, sprints? Where, where's, the, where's the bang for your buck when it comes to preventing a heart attack? That's a great question. And I actually probably defer to you. I mean, you have more exercise experience than <laughs> I ever will. Um, you know, it's that joke. It's like, I'm the cardiologist who, you know, does not like to exercise. I do it because well, I know of its benefits. <laughs> I mean, I think everybody listening is like, okay, I can agree. I can agree with the statement like that I should exercise, right? Like we should move Correct. our bodies. But I think, um, I don't know. I think there could be some debate about, you know, is it cardio? Is it weightlifting? Is it sprinting? You know, yeah, I don't know. What, then, what are your thoughts? Uh, you don't have, nobody's right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's yes. It's, it's also depends on what their goals are. Cause yeah, if you're training for a sport, this is a completely different conversation for that individual. But if somebody's like, I just want to be 90 years old and healthy and playing with my grandkids or great grandkids. Okay. What do you need to do to get to that situation? So I like that idea of like, what would you like to do? You know, as you age, you know, if you still want to be golfing when you're 90, well, how flexible are you right now? If you don't work on your flexibility and balance now, you're not gonna be able to do that when you're 90, but it's kind of like, the answer is all of them. They're all important. It's just how much time are you willing to budget to each of them? So that's what I'm starting to try to do with patients. Like how many hours a week are you willing to do this? You know, if you tell me you only got four hours, well, I want half of it to be resistance strength training and half of it, some type of cardiorespiratory fitness, but that's low. Like you should be doing much more if you're really going for the longevity aspect. But from a cardiorespiratory fitness, I mostly right now, I'm just helping people understand the benefits of doing zone two type training where it's the low and slow type of cardio that you don't think you're getting much benefit from, mm -hmm. but it's really all about, which is like walking really. I mean, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. A brisk walk where, you know, it should be about a five out of 10 on your intensity scale. You should mm -hmm. still be able to hold the conversation. And ideally you'd be monitoring your heart rate to kind of see where your heart rate is, but it's at a pace where your mitochondria are going to be maximally efficient at burning fat for energy. Once you start getting into yeah. the interval trainings, you know, you have to use glucose exclusively for energy and glucose, you know, it's a fast hit energy, but you know, you have to keep replenishing it. We have a lot more stored body fat than we do glycogen in our system. So you, again, you want the mitochondria to be flex fuel. You want them to be tap into the fat, tap into the sugar. Well, how do you train the fat burning mode? It's that low and slow type cardio. So how much? Probably 80% of whatever time you're going to do cardio should be in that type of zone two type training. And then one day or two days a week, you're doing the interval type training to build the peak VO2 max, you know, which is kind of like a vital sign of, well, how much, you know, is your cardiorespiratory fitness going to protect you long term? So the higher your VO2 max, the better you tend to do. But, you know, do you have to do all interval training? Absolutely not. Most of it should be low and slow. Yeah. But the engines are your mitochondria. 
Well, what do the muscles have? A whole bunch of mitochondria. So how do you have more mitochondria? You do more resistance training, so you build more engines. Yeah. Yeah. You, I mean, you know, I'm friends with Gabrielle Lyon, so I'm, yeah. you know, I'm in the camp of, of muscle as an organ of longevity. And I think particularly because I take care of women, that that is like definitely not the cool, sexy thing to lift weights. But unfortunately, as women go through life and they hit this stage of perimenopause and menopause, what happens on a very profound level <laughs> is they, their mitochondria, if they come into menopause without muscle mass, with weak bones, with weak mitochondria, and then they lose estrogen, I mean, the role of estrogen in our metabolic health and, and in mitochondrial health, I just talked about this at a few conferences this year, is it's a big deal. It changes gene transcription in the mitochondria with the loss of estrogen. And now suddenly our risk of heart disease skyrockets. And so I'm a huge fan for that reason of protecting the lean body mass. And I think women are just sold this story of like cardio, 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 like, you know, run on the treadmill, get on the elliptical. And this will be a very unpopular statement, but, you know, orange theory fitness and uh, F45 and all these things that are like these high intensity boot camps. I don't think that's what women need. I mean, it's not helping them build muscle. It's just ramping their cortisol even more. It's stressing out their bodies. They're not recovering from it. They're not nutritionally recovering from it. Um, and so I'm more of a fan of lifting weights on a regular basis, walking a lot and just not being sedentary and then occasionally doing, you know, some high intensity sprint training. But I'm talking like actual sprint, like minutes, like we're talking like, you know, two minutes of sprinting, not like a 45 to an hour long boot camp class. I would definitely agree with that. And yeah, All right. a lot of the nutritional recommendations on protein obviously came from Dr. Lyon and her mentor, yeah. Donna Lehman. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's in a world that we live in of like processed foods that are just like, it's really hard to avoid them. I think that leveraging protein for most people is just such a good strategy for avoiding all that other crap because that all that crap is generally carbs and fat. Like if you want to eat more protein, it's actually really hard to like strategically find that. <laughs> like unless you're meal prepping a bunch of chicken and beef and whatever it is on Sunday night, which is, a, which is what we have to do around here. Okay. So uh, let's shift to the last, uh, last part of the podcast called the semen analysis. You guys, I pulled uh, an article. We've mentioned the ketogenic diet a few times. And I think Dr. Twyman has kind of said, you know, it's a tool, I think seasonally, cyclically, maybe we went in and out of ketosis, but I am so fascinated by the role of ketones as a cellular signaling molecule and not just, you know, the ketogenic diet being about weight loss, being about um, just using, you know, fat oxidation and ketones. I think ketones do a lot of other things in our body that we're just now kind of figuring that out. And this is called, the, art, the article is called Cardiac Ketone Body Metabolism. It was published um, in, uh, in June of 2020. And it basically talks about how we have these different ketone bodies uh, that we make. So beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, uh, you guys uh, have heard me talk about these. But um, there are some different studies looking at, um, I know early on when I was eating a ketogenic diet, I found this study on, it was in rats, but basically they gave them a heart attack and then they infused beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, they gave it uh, intravenously. And it seemed that the cardiac myocytes, that this was a way to actually spare the amount of damage uh, and destruction. You know, and we all in every emergency room, right? There's like a protocol when people come in with a with a STEMI or you know a heart attack. Basically, you know, give them an aspirin, give them a beta blocker. Like this is we know these things that help save people from dying. Okay, so this is talking about heart failure. So they basically the recent evidence reviewed here indicates that increased ketone body metabolism is a feature of heart failure, meaning that maybe the heart is looking for an alternative energy source. So. They weren't sure, though, the conclusion of it was whether the change in myocardial ketone body metabolism is adaptive or maladaptive. Because I think when I was in medical school, ketones were pathologic, right? Diabetics, yeah. like yeah, ketones in the bloodstream. Yeah. It's pathology. It's pathology. Yeah. Um, and they're probably more physiologic than we realize. So what's your kind of understanding of, of heart cells, the heart, using ketones as an energy source for people? No, it's a, it's a big uh, utilization uh, source of ketones. You know, the heart cells, you know, have approximately 3,000 mitochondria per cell. You know, the heart, the brain are the most energy dense organs, and that's where the majority of diseases occur. The quick side note, 
your one of your organs of interest, the ovaries. Yeah, I was about to say, more, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, it, it actually <laughs> has the most mitochondria per cell at a hundred thousand mitochondria yeah. per cell. But in the you know most cases, the chronic diseases they show up in the heart and brain because it's an issue with mitochondria energy production. So yeah. I would look at that as that you know a sick heart is energy starved. You know the mitochondria are failing and able to keep up with energy demands. You know, there's a you know epidemic of diastolic dysfunction, meaning the heart does not relax very well. The heart starts getting stiffer. You know, high blood pressure is one of the major contributors to it. But you know, it's mostly in the conventional cardiology world. You're almost like, well, they have diastolic heart failure. There's not great drugs for this. You know, there's many drugs for systolic heart failure where the heart doesn't squeeze well and their ejection fraction is low. You know, you give patients beta blockers and ACE inhibitors and spironolactone and you know the SGL2 inhibitors and the patients do better, but um, but you can think of that pretty easy. The heart doesn't have enough energy to squeeze, but it actually takes more energy for the myocytes to relax. So ketones, you know, um, are going to be more energy dense. You know, fats have more, you know, electrons than carbohydrates do. So it's just a preferential that like you're doing whatever has the most electrons in my mind, why the mitochondria would be more fat burning or would prefer to do it if it had the option to. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. You know, I know Chris Palmer is doing so much with mental health and kind of, you know, ketones using them for the broken brain. I think of this as like, you know, can the broken heart use ketones? Um, I think it's a cool, you know, uh, tool to think about as we think about our metabolic health and we are we are sick. A lot of us are very sick. (laughs) Well, Dr. Twyman, tell people um, how they can find you, your website, your social media. Maybe they want to become your patient because I know I've sent people to you before. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to to chat with your audience. It's always fun to talk with somebody who's interested in longevity, nutrition, sleep, biohacking, red light therapy, all the things that help mitochondria function. It's always great to talk to this audience. But you know, my practice, Apollo Cardiology, is located in St. Louis, Missouri. I work with patients from all over the country. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you can go to my website. It's drtwyman.com. And I'm on social media. Not a lot. I consider social media the matrix. I go in there to try to help <laughs> unplug the people who are interested in mitochondrial medicine or preventive cardiology, and then I unplug them from there. But I am on Instagram, and it's the handle Dr. Twyman. I love it. Well, you guys, what's good for the ovaries uh, is good for the heart and vice versa. So thank you guys for listening. Hey, make sure you share this with somebody in your life that would find it interesting, find it important, because we definitely rely on all of you to spread these messages around the world. We'll talk to you soon. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.